Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for this is a wonderfully robust turnout on a, on a chilly Wednesday. I'm, I'm John Boddy. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be the head here at Browning, and I, I want to welcome you to, to the second installment uh, of this year's uh, Today's Boys, Tomorrow's Men's Speaker Series. This is a series that's made possible by a really generous grant from the E. Ford Foundation, and it happens three times a year, and our, our, our triannual program invites members of the Browning community and associated friends, and I see some new friends out there today, uh, it invites everyone to, to learn about the research and practices uh, that are helping to foster the social, emotional, and intellectual growth of boys, right, both at Browning uh, and beyond our school. All right, you know, we bring in noted scholars and practitioners to meet with our students, our faculty and staff, and our families. And uh, our school is working to encourage uh, the clearest thinking uh, and the needed action that's gonna support boys in their development, their self-understanding, and both their opportunities and their responsibilities uh, as they explore healthy definitions of masculinity and consider the ways in which they can lead lives of, of meaning, uh, both for themselves uh, and for others. All right? you know, our sons are, are gonna reflect the boyhoods that they experience. And, and this series is part of Browning's attempt to encourage honesty and curiosity and dignity and purpose in line with our mission for the men of tomorrow. Um, so it's great to see you. Uh, I'm really excited for you to get to meet our this evening's guest. We just had a wonderful session with our faculty this, uh, this afternoon. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, let me throw it back to my friend and my colleague, uh, the coordinator of our speaker series, uh, assistant head of school and our head of upper school, Mr. Gene Campbell. Thank you, John. Uh, for those of you just joining us, I'm going to put the, the Dr. Chu's question in the chat one more time. Um, I've noticed as, as they're going through, we've got preschool through junior year. Actually, I saw a senior parent on, on here. Um, so quite an age range. This is one of the great joys of my life is to be a part of this series uh, and to get to to learn from these experts that we're able to bring in uh, because I've been I've been doing this for a long time at this point uh, in boys schools uh, in my career almost 20 years just at boys schools, uh, but also as a parent of a kindergartner here at a boys school and so. Um, I will be listening and learning with everyone along the way and i'm just really grateful uh, for your presence here tonight right. I'm equally grateful uh, for Dr. Judy Chu's presence here tonight. Uh, Dr. Chu is a lecturer in human biology and affiliate of the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University, where she teaches a course on bo boys' psychosocial development. Her research highlights boys' relational strengths and examines the impact of boys' gender socialization during early childhood and adolescence. She is the author of When Boys Become Boys, Development, Relationships, and Masculinity, and co-editor of Adolescent Boys, Exploring Diverse Cultures of Boyhood. She appeared in and developed curricula for the Representation Project's film, The Mask You Live In. She currently serves as a chair, as chair of, global, of the Global Advisory Committee at Movember, which helps men to live happier, healthier, longer lives, and co-chair on the board of directors for ProMundo US, which, helps, which works to advance gender equality, promote healthy masculinity, and prevent violence. All right, Dr. Chu, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Let me get you spotlight, spotlight here for everyone. First of all, thank you to everyone who responded in the chat. I really enjoyed reading your responses and I love, I just really, I admire everything that you as parents are, you know, that you're trying to do for your boys. And I love that your, your dreams for them are so positive and so healthy. And um, so I, I really appreciate that. And I also on that note, I'm going to close my chat box because I can't multitask. <laughs> and so I'm. Um, Jean will be kindly um, keeping an eye on the chat box in case anyone does have questions or comments or you know, feel free to interrupt me at any time, especially if I've said something that's unclear or confusing, I'm happy to you know, stop and address. I don't wanna leave anybody behind um, because of something that I've said that needed clarification. But um, again, because I can't um, <laughs> stay focused on what I'm trying to remember to say, um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to actively monitor the box myself. Um, yeah, so one, uh, one of the reasons I, I wanted to ask that was uh, uh, just to get a sense of who's in the room. And I have such a lovely sense from your responses. And also because that was one of the questions that my mentor, Carol Gilligan, um, used to ask the, the fathers of the boys that we, we studied, the four, the four to six year old boys. I actually studied boys at adolescence and also at early childhood. When we talked to the fathers of the four and five year old boys, one of the questions that Carol brought up was, you know, what do you see in your sons that, you, that makes you think, you know, I hope he never loses that. You know, what do you kind of see as being at risk and how, you know, how are you navigating kind of the dilemma of trying to preserve their most, you know, appealing, 
wonderful, sensitive qualities, but also being fearful that, you know, society might not be kind to them or, or might somehow hurt them if they if they make themselves vulnerable in those ways. And so um, definitely appreciate the kind of um, difficult, the, the challenges of, of trying to maintain that balance. And we'll speak to that a little bit. So today, um, I would love to tell you more about that, actually, what some, what to some um, might be a new way of thinking about and looking at voice, which very much came out of um, the work of Carol Gilligan and the Harvard Project on Women's Psychology and Girls' Development, and then grew and expanded to include my studies and Niobe Way's studies. I know that she she is uh, actively involved at the Browning School, and that she has told me wonderful things about, you know, the whole community there, everything from the leaders to the parents to the kids themselves. And so it's incredible, an incredible honor and pleasure to be here with you tonight. And thank you for tuning in. Um, so I wanted to start out just in case some of you might not um, know the background of, you know, kind of this new, this new quote, quote unquote, new perspective on boys and how, how that came to be. Because actually for the first, you know, century of human studies of human development and psychology, most of the studies were conducted primarily with boys and men, you know, particularly um, white middle class and upper class educated families, boys from those families. And so oftentimes people will say, well, why do we need to look at boys again? What's, you know, what's different? And what was, what happened was that upon noticing that most of these studies were so um, focused and based on a specific population, Carol Gilligan and her colleagues from the Harvard Project said, you know, well, what would happen if we, you know, included girls in some of these studies? What would happen if we went to girls and tried to understand their lives and experiences from their perspectives, what came to be known as a relational voice-centered method, which is really just trying to understand, you know, hear people's stories, you know, within the context of their lives and appreciating what issues were coming up, what they were going through, and therefore informing how best to support them. And I think the original intention or goal was to create a complementary model for, of girls' development because, you know, the, the assumption was that we already know about boys and men. So, and we, you know, the girls, piece was missing. So let's create a model based on girls. But what happened was in listening to girls and women in this way, um, the Harvard Project revealed aspects of human development that were relevant to boys and men's experiences as well, that were not included, not represented in standard accounts of human development and psychology. And so it really changed the conversation. It really called into question models of development that had really emphasized and focused on that progression towards individual, you know, individuation and separation in the name of growth and maturity and for boys, masculinity. So this idea that, you know, to grow up and to become a man was to move out of and away from relationships. And what the, um, what the work with the girls and women really um, highlighted was the centrality of relationships. This idea that you know it's not that we are we operate in a vacuum and we develop with the option of having relationships and that relationships are great but we don't really you know we, that we're somehow uh, independent of them but really saying that it's really inextricably through and within the context of our interpersonal relationships as well as our social and cultural context that for instance messages about gender become you know personally meaningful and directly consequential to us. It's really through and within relationships that we learn and we develop and grow and that we come to know ourselves and that we come to understand what other people are like and what the world is like. And so it really um, created a new paradigm, which is how, you know, why I call it a new way of thinking and looking at it because it kind of challenged, you know, those kind of individualized models and, and created a more relational framing of, of human development and psychology and just kind of life experience, our life experiences. And so uh, without going into too much detail on the girl, girl, girls work, which I could speak about for weeks <laughs> in and of itself, what I wanted to highlight from that work is that it really kind of challenged our conceptions of what is normal, what is healthy, what does it mean to be well adjusted and what does it mean to be successful? because we were defining them in kind of, again, very individualistic kinds of ways. And we were kind of saying like, if an individual doesn't attain or achieve kind of these societal expectations, these, these standards that we had set, that it was a problem with the individual. There's something wrong with you know, a boy or, or, or an individual who can't meet 
kind of our, our cultural constructions of gender who are somehow failing. And rather than saying than, than blaming the individual, these models kind of said, well, wait a minute, you know, can we look at what we're asking of them? You know, are these reasonable expectations? Are these healthy models of ways of being? Like if they are to, if they do achieve these, you know, ideals, what is what is their life going to be like? You know, and, and, and does it serve them well? And so um, the girl, what happened is the research with the girls, the girls articulated the struggle. The girls highlighted the possibility that our cultural constructions of gender could be harmful. Because obviously, you know, in a culture that values masculinity over femininity and males over females, girls are going to have, you know, kind of accommodating themselves to the, to that um, to those expectations is going to be psychologically and relationally costly to girls. And so what, what the girls work really showed was that patriarchal constructions of gender could be harmful to girls and women. And it raised immediately the question of, well, what about boys? Could boys and men also experience maybe um, struggles or negative consequences to their accommodate you know, from their accommodation to constructions of masculinity, despite the certain you know, social advantages of being male and as, you know, acting masculine? And so, what it did was the boys' work really kind of uh, revisited or reconsidered boys' development from the premise of you know first of all, that all humans are relational. And, and that's evidenced by infant studies that show that, you know, all humans are born with a fundamental capacity and a primary desire for a close, mutual, emotionally responsive relationships that we need these to survive during infancy and that these are essential to thriving throughout the life course. And so, you know, it's, it, but what, it, what, the, um, what the what about boys question really raised was, you know, you know, what, what does boys' developmental trajectory, their socialization and development look like when we start from the premise that they have this capacity and desire, and then we move them towards these constructions of masculinity that really say, no, you need to be, you know, tough all the time, you need to, you know, tamper down, suppress, or definitely not show your, net, you know, emotional vulnerabilities, you need to act like you're self-sufficient, like you don't need relationships, you need to stand alone, you need to prove yourself that you can do it all by yourself, that you don't need anyone. What does, how is that experienced by boys? And so I actually um, began my studies with adolescent boys, because it just so happened that um, what, after learning some of these things my first year as a doctoral student at Harvard, um, learning about you know, the Harvard Project's work and Carol Gilligan's work, I happened to go home and was uh, spending the summer chauffeuring my 13-year-old brother and his friends um, around our uh, suburb of Southern California, which you, know, you can't get anywhere in Southern California without a car. So I was driving them around and they wanted to know what I had learned and or, or what I was learning. And I told them about this work, you know, that the work with adolescent girls and how you know, researchers were trying to understand what it was like for them so that they could better support them. And one of the boys said to me, you know, that's great and that's important. And I understand why you need to do that or why, why researchers are doing that, but you know, there's stuff going on for boys too and nobody's talking to us. And so he said, you know, you should study boys. You should start with me. And so, you know, in a, in, in a way I was, um, I like to say that I was led to study boys by boys themselves who said they had something to say and they wanted people to know. And I was, I was very honored to be in the right place at the right time to kind of help to convey some of their, you know, concerns and questions and also their strengths. I think, cause that was really, really underrepresented um, in the academic discourse, certainly, which had, in, in, at least in the context of relational development was always comparing boys to girls and always saying how boys were falling short now you know yeah emotions and relationships girls that's what girls do that's what girls do well and that boys are in comparison you know either deficient or incapable or uninterested just a lot of garbage <laughs> you know for anyone who knows a boy who, you know, or who was a boy knows that that's not true and so there it was the moment was kind of ripe to kind of dispel some of those myths about what boys were actually like because those myths were trickling down. Even if the boys weren't reading the academic literature, their teachers, their you know community leaders were reading these books that were then you know and then in turn responding to boys in ways that reflected these stereotypes and misunderstandings. So anyway, so I started studying boys at adolescence, and what I was finding in these twelve to eighteen year old boys 
was that um, an overarching theme was that they were finding that the way boys are said to be and the way they experience themselves as boys to be, there was a big gap between that. And rather than kind of saying that this was a problem, what they kindly explained to me that, you know, part of growing up was just, come, you know, learning to accept that that gap was just going to exist. And that if they somehow struggled with it, that was a sign of their immaturity. That was a sign of their, you know, their own shortcomings. And so when I brought this um, initial finding to Carol, she said, well, you need to focus on an age where they're still actively kind of resisting that, where they're struggling against that, where they haven't yet figured out that they have to accept that as, as the way things are. And so, and her hypothesis was that, whereas early adolescence is a period of heightened risk, you know, kind of heightened pressures, because of heightened pressures to accommodate kind of societal expectations around femininity, that um, this tended to happen for boys earlier. And we see this in, you know, kind of messages that kids get about, you know, when boys start hearing, don't be a mama's boy, don't be a sissy, boys don't cry. It tends to come into boys' lives earlier, usually around ages three, four, five. Whereas girls can, are permitted, you know, to be tomboys and partly because we as a society value masculinity more than we value femininity being a girl being a tomboy isn't a problem that isn't problematic until maybe adolescence when they start to girls start developing sec secondary sex characteristics and start to look like young women and then they are expected accordingly to behave like what society determines are good women um so anyway uh my studies let's see where am I in my <laughs> I'm trying to follow the narrative because earlier I I just kind of went all on my own frame of view and it totally went over so oh okay so at every, every age, you know, uh, relationships are central. The exploratory study is what I really found in adopting this relational framework, assuming that they have this capacity and desire and seeing what happens to it, um, focusing on boys' perspectives um, to kind of learn what they knew, what they're capable of knowing and doing and how they were experiencing their gender socializations. What became very apparent for both age groups, the adolescents and the younger boys is that they have these relational capabilities that are human strengths, not feminine weaknesses that are essential to their health and happiness because it helps them because they are necessary for developing emotionally close relationships that the boys sought that the boys crave that the boys need in order to you know be happy and healthy in their lives and so this idea that they are boys as young as four years old um express the ability to be authentic and direct and articulate and attentive in their relationships. They were reading social cues and interpersonal dynamics with interest and accuracy. Um, through adolescence, I continue, you know, like, like I said, you see these capabilities still, their ability to be fully present and genuinely engaged in their relationships, their ability to be self-aware, to be sensitive to feelings, their own as well as other people's, and to be attuned to kind of what's happening in the cultures around them, what, what other people value, what other people respond to, what, what are the consequences of deviating. They are reading all of those things with interest and with accuracy, and they are accordingly adapting to it. And in some ways, you know, that is you know, adapting, they're very successful, it's, it's, it's socially adaptive. But at the same time, there are certain psychological and relational costs to their becoming very adept at aligning with cultural constructions of masculinity that often tend to be very narrow and are also very much um, about proving masculinity by differentiating from femininity. So in a culture that kind of constructs um, the two, you know, masculinity and femininity as mutually exclusive opposites, the boys learn that they need to not only need to prove their masculinity, but they do so by displaying masculine, you know, norms of masculine behavior and eschewing anything, you know, related to femininity, including feminine behaviors and sometimes including girls and women. So you have to separate from your mother. So you have to not play with the girls. Otherwise that puts you at risk of being labeled I like a girl or unmanly or not a real boy, right? So um, the boys, uh, let's see, where are we? So one of the things that I found when I, um, upon kind of being, you know, not, not hit in the face with it, but just, just being really impressed by boys' relational capabilities was that um, they are often overlooked and underestimated. 
not only in the literature, the academic literature and the popular literature on boys, but also in their everyday lives. Like I, you know, as I, my son is now 18 years old, but I spent a lot of time when he was growing up on playgrounds, around other parents, around teachers, then hearing, you know, often with best intentions, you know, everything under the genre of what I consider as boys will be boys kind of things like, oh, look at how they run like a pack of wild animals or look at how they, you know, just all these things, these comments that get made every day that, of course, the parents hear, the boys themselves hear. I'd hear parents saying, oh, yeah, I, you know, my daughter and I were cut from the same cloth where I understand her completely. My son is like an alien to me. And I was like, why? I mean, why? <laughs> What's happening? And the boy and the boy is standing right there. And so they're hearing these things. And I'm just kind of feeling like, you know, first of all, to, to kind of be more aware of the messages that we are passing on both explicitly and, and implicitly to boys, but and also really thinking about the impact that it's making on them, because they are looking to us as examples um, for what how to see themselves, how to understand other people and the way that other people see them and to kind of figure out how it's possible for them to be in the world and for um, and to be with other people. And again, going back to that, you know, adolescent boys, their observations that, you know, there's ways that people will see us as a boy. And then there are ways that I experience myself and, you know, I would love for them to see who I really am, but it just doesn't, you know, more often than not, it seems unlikely. And so if we can kind of, you know, you know, just always thinking about, you know, how do we work against that? How do we, you know, a lot of you express in the chat box, like this wish that, you know, for boys to be able to show who they are, to be authentic, to feel like they can bring themselves wholly and in their integrity into their relationships, you know, what needs to happen, what needs to change, not only in the boys themselves, but in all the relationships, not, not just in families, not just in schools, but on, on a broader level of society, what needs to change in order for that to happen, for, in order for that to be safe? to be a viable option. Because I think, you know, on one hand, we have very admirable goals. Like, yes, we want everybody to be able to do these things. But then we also, you know, as the social psychologists have long said, you know, the behavior reflects the person and the situation. And so if we're not seeing behaviors that we think we would expect to see as a part of just kind of the range of normal human behavior, then we need to ask, you know, what's happening for that individual, but also in their context, that's making it easy or difficult for them to bring themselves fully into, um, into relationship with other people. So um, let me see, I'm, I've already betrayed myself by skipping all over the place because I get into it. But um, so boys, uh, developmental trajectory, we said we started out with, you know, infants where we, there's, you know, all these studies have shown how there's this capacity and desire um, that is not specific to one sex or the other. And yet, when we look at their developmental trajectory, we see these studies of older boys, adolescent boys, adult men who are reporting that they have fewer, you know, Niobe Way's work is one, of, one example, you know, these older um, boys and men who say, you know, they're reporting fewer close friendships, particularly same-sex friendships, and lower levels of emotional intimacy within those friendships. So this would suggest that something is happening along the way in the course of boys' socialization and development that is making it difficult. It's ironic, right? Because with age and experience, they're somehow becoming less good at forming relationships. So there's something that is working against them because usually in learning and in life and in development, we get better you know, we get better with the more knowledge and experience that we have. So something in their, their environment is telling them that this is not for them or that this is not going to be valued in them. And, you know, and again, as parents and, and as, as educators and, and it just, you know, influences in boys' lives, we're trying to think of how can we deliver a different message and the earlier, the better, you know, so, you know, particularly for those of you with, with young kids, but, you know, adolescent boys still, it's, still there. They do not lose these capabilities. They do not lose the desire for connections. They continue throughout their lives to seek connections and resist disconnections. So how can we, at every identified point of you know, obstacle and challenge, how do we come in and try to intervene in ways that really support boys to um, preserve their sense of integrity and to continue to, um, to be able to uh, seek and develop, identify and develop these protective relationships. So what's happening um, in terms of their gender socialization? Well, one of the themes, like I mentioned earlier, is this theme of the need to prove masculinity. It's not an assumption that is made simply because of you know, physiology or whatever. You know, who, 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 it's, it's, um, it's this lifelong need to kind of um, prove that they are truly one of the boys and with the boys. And also to, um, and, and 
my students often ask why, <laughs> who created this need to prove masculinity? And so I looked up kind of the history of it and it has one, one, of, the, one of the reasons or one of the things that has to do with is access to male privilege. So again, in our society where we, you know, where we prize or value one, one gender over the other, the, you know, masculinity holds certain privileges certain advantages and status. And so in order to say that, you know, that you're worthy of those things, you have to prove your masculinity. Um, other aspects of their gender socialization include, of course, the messages about masculinity, which are ba it's basically the rules for engagement. Like if you're going to enter and engage as a boy, this is how you need to do it. This is how you need to conduct yourself. And the boys learn those very, very quickly. They look around because they are motivated by their, their desire to relate and connect. And so that's where it's, I always say it's kind of like a paradox for them because the reason they do it, the reason they learn to prove their masculinity, to behave in these ways is largely driven by their desire for connection. But ironically, the scripts that our society provides for boys to engage socially in order to, you know, to achieve social acceptance and approval, ironically leads them away from those kinds of it. It, it makes it more difficult for them to, to establish and develop the very relationships that motivate them in, first, in the first place to conform. And then of course, there's also you know, just pressures to conform, which is the consequences you know, of deviance. And so earlier I tried sharing a visual that was very poorly made. So I'm just gonna ask you to, and I, it, I don't think it was a good visual. So I'm gonna, just gonna try to ask you to in, close your eyes and imagine it. Um, and so you've probably heard of the man box just because it's gotten a lot of play in a lot of um, media messages about masculinity and how masculinity can be problematic. And I just wanted to highlight a couple aspects of this man box and the way that it works. Cause I think it helps to illustrate the process, the way that socialization works. Cause it's not so much like, oh, you tell boys you have to do this. And they say, oh, okay, you know, I better do that then. Cause most boys will directly oppose that. They'll say, no, you know, that's not for me. I mean, it, everything from eat your vegetables to, to whatever, but like, but so that's not really how it works. What is, what, so the um, Paul Kibble who created this activity to illustrate the process started out with, and what he would do is he'd go to an audience and he'd draw you know, a big box or square on the board and he'd ask the audience. And sometimes it was um, students, sometimes it was parents, adults, but everyone could always respond to this. And he'd say, you know, what do you think of when I say be a man or be a real man, man up, it's time to man up. And usually you'd get the whole thing of like kind of conventional um, constructions of masculinity. Um, things like be tough, be stoic, be self-sufficient, all these kinds of things. And then he would say, so that's what it is you know, to be in the box, right? The, the man box. And that this is a very limited and limiting construction of masculinity. And then he would say, okay, well then what, what's going to happen to a boy if he is not these things that are in the box? And what in, then another whole list would happen. And we'd put that outside the box. So on, on a chalkboard or a blackboard, you would write down like all the things. And it's usually things like sissy, wuss, or less appealing words that usually connote femininity, are meant to be derogatory, are meant to imply weakness, and you know, just you know, unacceptability. And so he'd say, the likelihood that a boy will be called those things if he is not in the box represents the pressure a boy experiences to stay in the box. So it's not so much that boys are told straight out, you know, you have to do this, this, and this, and the boys comply. It's more the kind of anticipation of how other people might mock them, might disrespect them, might devalue them if they are not those things. It's the fear and shame of feeling like they have somehow fallen short of something that evidently or apparently people seem to prize that keeps them feeling like they have to, you know, stay with stay within that box. But, you know, in a nutshell, it turns out to be a trap because it's obviously not safe to be outside of the box because of the whole risk of ridicule and rejection, but it's also not safe to be inside the box because that version of masculinity is precarious or masculinity itself is precarious. Like this whole, you know, it's set up so that anyone can question a boy's or boy or man's masculinity at any time. Like uh, some of the examples that I've heard from adolescent boys are, you know, you wear pink to school one day, or you admit that you like, you know, some some musical group that's that's not seen as a really manly musical group, or you eat your potato chips the wrong way, or you, you know, it used to be even stuff like you carry your books the wrong way, or you wear your backpack on the wrong. Way. There's all these little like um, tests 
constant test of, and so at any any time, any point for almost just about anything, you can be emasculated. So boys are put into a situation where they feel like they have to constantly defend, prove and defend their masculinity, that it's precarious and that it's something that they kind of have to always um, always be on, on the lookout for, like ways in which they might, you know, someone might call them out. Um, and the other side of that is that um, Joe Pleck in his book, The Myth of Masculinity, points out that you know, after all that, <laughs> that, that image of masculinity that's kind of held above all other, other masculinities, that's unattainable. Nobody can be everything inside that box all at all ages, at all times, in all contexts. Nobody can. So what's happened is all boys and men are left to, you know, kind of strive towards an image of masculinity in relation to which they will inevitably fall short. And so there's always this feeling of, you know, you know, low self-esteem from knowing, you know, see, knowing that they don't actually, you know, can't actually, aren't actually those things all the time. There's an anxiety and insecurity around being found out that other will, other people will see the ways in which they fall short and call them out for it or judge them for it. It just creates a lot of unnecessary distress. And also, again, obstacles to intimacy, because if you don't want, if you have to be that guarded and that careful about what you show people, it's that much more difficult to kind of enter a relationship. You know, it's hard enough to figure out what we think and feel as it is, but to have to worry on top of that, that what you're thinking and feeling might, you know, cause people to, you know, dis to devalue you or to disrespect you or to kind of just decide that you're not worth their time adds a whole, but a whole new layer of stress and anxiety and distress. And so, um, it's by, particularly for people who believe, and I guess I should qualify that by saying particularly for individuals who believe that it's important for boys and men to be real men, that they, they, they especially will struggle with that kind of lifelong expectation of needing to project an image of masculinity that is very familiar because it's consistent with all of our masculine stereotypes and culture, but ultimately misrepresents them. And as a result, threatens to undermine their integrity and hinder their relationships. So um, what's one of the things that may or may not surprise you is that you know some of these messages about masculinity, and in case you not familiar, and I guess it all comes down to uh, kind of four basic rules of manhood that have been around since 1976. So I you know surprisingly to me, boys today are still to some extent being held in some contexts. Um, to standards of masculinity that their fathers and grandfathers were held to. I mean, these are one of these, you know, like why does this, this endure? You know, but like the four kind of basic rules, um, according to David and Brannon, is no sissy stuff, which is reject femininity. So we had talked about that when we define masculinity as the opposite of feminine, uh, masculinity is the opposite of femininity. Then everything that's feminine becomes kind of, um, off limits. The second is be a big wheel, which is striving for status and power and wealth. And this comes in, you know, all sorts of forms that we, you know, kids see it all the time in the media, in the movies, you know. And then the third is be a sturdy oak. So that's the kind of stoicism point, like never show emotions, never show weakness, you know, this kind of facade of invulnerability, which of course is completely unrealistic because vulnerability is part of the human condition, but we don't tell our kids that enough. And so they all think they have to go out and prove themselves by being in control all of the time, confident all of the time when nobody is like that all of the time. And so just, um, and then the fourth one is give them hell, which of course, you know, is dated in terms of the language, but it's about being daring and taking risks and being aggressive or violent if necessary. Like when the, when the time calls for this, then you got to step up, you got to man up and you got to be these things. And so, and these again are, are in, are conveyed explicitly, implicitly in fictional as well as factual, you know, representations of men that boys are unfortunately exposed to all the time. But the, one of the bright sides to this, and I forgot to mention this in the faculty talk, is if you do that same box and you ask people, well, what does it mean to be a good man or a great man? Like, let's say someone has passed and people are saying he was a good man. What does that mean? Then you get another definition of masculinity. So yes, they do all know, everyone knows the real man image, but they, we also know the good man image. And so we are 
at least subconsciously aware of multiple masculinities, that, there is, that, that that's a possibility. And that means if there's a possibility, then that means that there's an option, that there's, a, you know, that there's an alternative to the kind of hegemonic or domineering narrative of masculinity that tends to be the first thing that people come to mind. But when we step back and think, it's just kind of like with stere all stereotypes, like you go, oh, the stereotype. And if you go looking for things that fit the stereotype, you see it everywhere. But if you shift your focus or the paradigm, and you go looking for that, you'll see lots of examples of really good men, really great men. In fact, and Gina and I were talking earlier at the um, earlier session about this kind of, uh, this really important point that masculinity is not inherently problematic. You know, there are aspects of, you know, there are qualities and skills that we tend to associate with masculinity, responsibility, loyalty, which are all very admirable and worthy of striving towards. And so it is not that you know, I, I really don't like the term toxic masculinity because I don't think it's accurate and I don't think it's helpful. Um, I think if you have to use toxic, I think it's toxic patriarchy. I mean, there's this idea that there's a, there's a hierarchy, that there's, you know, a stratification, that there's, you know, men over women and then some men over other men. I think that those are more damaging. It's a, it's a, it's a more um, dangerous or harmful uh, structure then it because and also there's a slippery slope to when you say masculinity then all of a sudden it seems like you're saying boys and men are toxic and that's problematic and, and also untrue so not helpful <laughs> so um i digress and i'll come back um so when well but what i wanted to say is although we do now recognize that there are multiple masculinities we know the good guys the good men great men as well as the real men these gender biases persist. I mean, as recently as 2018, there was a Pew Research study that showed that biases still influence the traits that we value in each gender. And I say we as a collective society, I mean, I know that there are individual, you know, individual differences, but you know, on average in our society, there continues to be a tendency, for instance, to value kindness and responsibility more consistently in women, to value strength and ambition more consistently in men and to be ambivalent about compassion and care. We love compassion and care, but we're ambivalent about it in men and we definitely see it as a positive. So, and then there's also the added, you know, kind of confusing message to boys and men where we'll say, oh, a lot of people will view emotional men negatively and yet at, while at the same time criticizing men for not expressing their feelings. And so we really have to think about like the messages that we're putting out there, what we're, what we're saying we value and what, you know, especially for younger boys and adolescent boys who are like try just trying to figure out, you know, what's the deal so that I can figure out how to navigate through. And while preferably discovering what's, what's actually right for me, who I am, how I wanna bring myself into the conversation, into this world. So again, you know, at this point that you know socialization becomes problematic, not because masculinity is problematic, right? So the solution cannot be simply, although I agree definitely, we need more positive, more healthy constructions of masculinity, but it cannot simply end with replacing one list with another. You know, like a, a kind of old fashioned comparison would be like, oh, instead of macho men, now we want the sensitive man and saying, okay, so now go be this. Because I think part of the problem is the imposition of an externally defined idea of how they're supposed to be. Either way, it's somebody else telling them, here is the one right best way to be. And you need to either change who you are or you know, become more of this in order to accommodate what we decide is going to be a value. And of course that can also change. That can change from generation to generation or from context or culture to, to, to other contexts and culture. And so then, so that really, I think that um, some of the roots of the problem are that the need to prove masculinity erodes boys and men's feelings of adequacy. There is this implicit message of you are not enough as you are. You need to become something else or something more in order to be worthy and valued. And I, earlier I had, you know, at the other session, I had mentioned that I, you know, one of my personal heroes is Mr. Rogers, because I think that his message of I like you just the way you are, as simple as that sounds, is so hard to create for our children. And it, but it's so worth trying to create that, you know, it, that's, that's the goal. And I'm like, until, you know, people who, 
when I say that, oftentimes people will be like, I can't believe you're quoting Mr. Rogers. But I'm like, but have we managed that yet? We have not. And so I think that that's one of the primary goals because I think that that message is actually central to this idea of connection and relationships and health and relation and healthy, you know, health and well being. Because I think it's a, um, a lot of what not just gender socialization, but just kind of every socialization in general is kind of telling people whatever you are and whether it's because of your gender or your race or your ethnicity or whatever, whatever you are is not quite right. So you need to become something different. And I think that that has, um, that does a lot of damage and kind of leads to a lot of the suffering, unnecessary suffering. I think life has, it comes with suffering, unfortunately, but the un unnecessary added suffering of kind of feeling shame about um, about what you bring uniquely to to the situation, to the world, to your relationships. And so boys are learning that, you know, they have to downplay and devalue what society has feminized, even though those things are part of their humanity and will serve them well in their professional lives, in their personal lives. Um, and, and again, are essential to their health and happiness. That is something that the organizations that I work with are finding um, with For Movember, like the area of focus that I oversee is mental health and suicide prevention. And a lot of times, you know, the lack of social connectedness, the, uh, um, the feelings of having compartmentalize their different parts of themselves because what's acceptable, what's not, what, what can they hold on to and acknowledge and value and what can they not, that causes a lot of internal distress and it causes a lot of hesitation around what they can show other people and share, which then again creates a sense of loneliness that as we know is a problem that's, you know, in some have described it you know, epidemic proportions. So, um, yeah, again, just in, in a summary nutshell, you know, boys are boys and men are often taught that they have to act stronger than they are, tougher than they feel, and always in control. And it's just, it's just an impossible standard to maintain. It's not sustainable, and it's um, it it doesn't. At the end of the day, it doesn't. It's, it's not a, not a helpful helpful goal to strive towards or a helpful re, um, helpful expectation to have. So one of the things that I found with the early or early um, <laughs> to bounce back to my studies of early childhood and the boys was that although they have these relational capabilities, and I used to describe them as wearing their hearts on their sleeves, you know, I said you never had to second guess what they were thinking or feeling because they could and would tell you exactly what they were thinking and feeling. And there is this kind of, um, it was very appealing and it was very refreshing and it was, you know, their exuberance and their openness and their friendliness and their honesty. And sometimes the honesty meant being shy or being, or not liking something. So it wasn't always like, you know, oh, this makes them so pleasant. It's just that you always got whatever they were, exactly what they were thinking. And that's the other thing. It's like, we'll tell kids we want them to be honest, but then sometimes that involves hearing things we don't wanna hear and kind of reminding ourselves like, you know, we ask for this, can we stay in that space with them? Can we stand in the fire with them? I know that with my son, not every day I was feeling like I could be, you know, um, be super happy with what I had asked for, but then, at, you know, in thinking about it being like, okay, I asked him to be honest and sometimes it's not gonna be what I wanted. And I, you know, and, and trying to figure out if how, how to be there in those ways. But um, sorry, again, I digress. Um, so these, uh, the, so one of the things that I found with the younger boys was that there was a shift. I, my book um, documents a transition in their lives from pre-K to kindergarten, four to six years old, from the time when they're wearing their hearts on their sleeves and sharing openly and honestly and exuberantly and being really affectionate with like their fathers in particular because it was more socially acceptable. Nobody had, tab had put a tab taboo on that. So it's really interesting. Like where they had already learned that they needed to kind of push their moms and be okay you know, especially in front of their other guy friends, be like, oh, mom, I pushed my mom out the door. But they, they somehow didn't transfer that to their father. So Carol and I witnessed these amazingly tender and affectionate moments before between the boys and their fathers, particularly during school drop-off, when they would sit together and kind of cuddle together and just really ease into the day together that were so lovely and, um, and obviously really um, important to both, both participants. But uh, over the course of their pre-K year, as they were kind of, um, they had formed something called the Moon Team, which was, a, you know, created by the boys, for the boys, for the express purpose of backing against the girls. And what they uh, were learn basically learning was what are the rules of engagement? The fact that you could, you know, that in addition to having to uh, prove your masculinity, you could get fired from the Moon Team. So you could actually become 
you know, people could say you're no longer a boy if you broke the new team's rules. And in light of those consequences, in light of those rules, the boys had begun to shift their relational presence such that where had they had been so clearly and so, you know, obviously authentic, direct, um, attentive and uh, articulate that they began to appear inarticulate, indirect, inauthentic and inattentive. And so they began to look like, you know, quote unquote, stereotypical boys. They began to, began to hear things like, I don't care, particularly around things that they cared a lot about. They, you know, they learned to say, you know, to kind of keep up their guard, which was what they were taught. You know, one of the adolescent boys explained it kind of retro, retro, in retrospect, like, you know, people who live in glass houses don't throw stones and you never know. And people, you know, people know things about you. If you reveal your vulnerability, then more likely that, you know, more likely than not, somebody's going to take advantage of that. And, you, you know, you don't want to reveal yourself because then you have to walk around being afraid and worried that somebody's going to use that against you at, you know, when you least expect it. And so why would you do that? Right. And so, and, but again, emphasizing that they don't lose the ability to express, they don't lose their relational capabilities nor their relational desire, but they are very much socially adaptively learning to, you know, make their way in an environment that to them sometimes feels hostile or antagonistic or at the minimal, you know, minimally competitive. And that, that's not to say that competition is always bad. There can be very good situations where competition can help everybody build themselves. You know, all individuals do better, you know, in relation to it, but there's also kind of more negative um, context in which competition comes at in, in more of a zero sum game where one person's success comes at the cost of another's failure. And so then it becomes a very um, stressful for the boys, for the individuals and not really conducive to growth because then it all come, is about more posturing. But so this shift in relational presence, I described as um, being from presence to pretense by way of posturing. So they learn the masculine posturing. They learn to display the behaviors that they see adults and others valuing and celebrating and kind of reinforcing, or at least tolerating. Like sometimes it's like boys will be boys behavior. Like, oh, this person hit the other person. And, and you know, being like, oh well, boys will be boys, which often, too often, is used to excuse poor behavior in boys and to hold them to lower standards of decency and empathy. And so, I don't love that term either. <laughs> Sorry to be so negative, but like, um, but so, you know, in response to you know, the shift was very much a reflection of how the boys are reading and responding to cultures of boyhood as they were experiencing them, you know. So sometimes even if they had families that were very much like, you know, do what you're gonna do, you know, we're gonna support you. They still had to, you know, they come into schools and or on the playground, you know, not even necessarily at school, but just in other contexts where not everyone, you know, believed the same, same things or valued the same quality or were just as open-minded in, in those ways and finding that, oh, it's not safe everywhere. And so, um, but again, the, 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 the bright side is that it's not all or nothing. And it's really about teaching them to be able to identify, you know, we, where are the prote protective relationships in their lives? Where are the safe spaces and the brave spaces? You know, who can they be with? Who are the adults that they know will be there for them and that, that they can be real with? And, and one of the um, studies, um, and you may be familiar with it, it's the Adolescent Health Study. It's, it's this longitudinal study that began in the late 90s by Michael Resnick and a huge research team. They started in Minnesota and it was like they got survey data from about 70,000 people, 70,000 adolescents. They interviewed like 40,000 of them. So this was just enormous. And they found that the single best protector against psychological risk, like you know, low self-esteem or depression and social risk, like unintended pregnancies, you know, gang involvement, substance use, school dropout, all these things that the single best protector against those risks was having access to at least one close confiding relationship. And that could be with a parent, it could be with a teacher, a mentor, a coach, a neighbor, you know, a friend, a, you know, a church leader, anybody, but kids who had at least one were much better able to kind of uh, survive and thrive within, you know, despite the challenges of growing up and despite the various, you know, obstacles that they faced, they were more resilient, they felt more um, validated and supported. And so it, it's kind of this sense of, you know, to kind of simplify it the sense of not being alone in the world, but being joined, but being in it together, knowing that they could count on somebody. Um, so that was really important. So again, kind of coming back to the, 
a theme that I know is one that Browning really, really emphasizes is the importance of connection and the importance of these protective relationships. And to the point where, you know, so many research studies have shown it that the question has really shifted, not so much from um, what do boys need? Because we know they need connection to themselves in terms of preserving their sense of integrity and to others in terms of feeling of the belonging, feeling that at least somebody else knows, one other person at least knows who they are, accepts them, loves them no matter what to the shift, the question becoming, well, how do we get them these relationships if they don't already have them? And so, I mean, with the parents who are here, I know that you are, you, you provide those relationships for the boys in your life, but also just kind of the, the boys who might not have those, how do we get those to them? Because it's not like the boys are saying like, oh no, I don't want the relationship. They want it, but they don't always know how to ask for it or how to develop it, how to know which ones are the relationships that will help them how to ask for help that they need. These are things that adolescent boys, particularly those are in, in, um, in underserved populations have, you know, are those, these are the real questions. Like I've heard, you know, in interviews, the boys will say, you know, I'd love to ask for help. I have no idea how to do it, right? And so I think a lot of the programs that, they've, um, that we've created here at Browning are really helping boys to give them language and permission to ask for help when they need it and to offer help when they when they see somebody else needs it, you know, when when they offer, offer help when they can give it. But um, again, I digress. I'm sorry. Um, no, Dr. So, Chu, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to give you a heads up. We've got about five minutes. Left. Five minutes. I know. Um, okay, so we did the pressure earlier, and um, I think I jumped around most of these things already. But let me just go to oh, maybe at the end just kind of um, general tips. I mean, I don't like to really prescribe anything, but these are just kind of general things that I've heard and tried to do that I found helpful. So in supporting boys and um, whether your parents or educators or anyone who, I, um, uh, with consistent with the relational approach to research and to um, working with boys, start with listening. I know it's very simple, but it's actually very hard to do. It's very hard to do well. Um, myself or myself included but you know boys need to experience with adults and especially men how talking can help and how acknowledging feelings makes them manageable and bearable again some of that language is Mr. Rogers um, one of the boys a seventh grader at a private all boys school said to me you know it's just the feeling that somebody knows what you're going through and relating it kind of comforts so it's not about being able to solve their problems it's not about being able to you know prevent their problems. They're going to face difficulties and struggles no matter what, but it's about kind of knowing that they don't have to do it alone and knowing that, you know, that it'll, you know, that, that somebody, you know, that, that just somebody else is, under, you know, there and understanding it. It helped, it, it, it's surprisingly helpful. It's surprisingly um, protective. Um, another one is alleviating shame and validating worth. So, you know, studies have shown that the most common shame trigger for boys and men is this fear of seeming weak and unworthy. It may be subconscious. Um, it's, it's sometimes surprising given that, you know, we say, oh, well, boys and men, they're the dominant group. They're the privileged group in our society. And maybe as a group, some of them are, but many of the individuals, and of course there's also group and individual differences, many of the individuals do not feel powerful, do not feel worthy. And so kind of really linking them to other people's, you know, common shared struggles, letting them know they're not alone, valuing who they are. Again, that comes back to the whole, you know, the notion that having to prove their masculinity instills, which is, you know, you're not enough, letting them know that who they are is enough, that you don't value them for what they do, but for who they already are and that you're there with them um, in, in their process of becoming. The other thing is, and I'm, gonna, I'm watching the clock, I'm gonna get it all in, um, normalizing boys' vulnerability, because that's another one that we really, as a society, tend to discount. We almost, I always say that we almost treat boys and men like they're robots. I, the examples that I use are like, you know, they break their arm or something and you're like, walk it off, you're okay. And I'm always like, it's gonna hurt. So physical pain, obviously, yes, they experience it. And unfortunately, that's not always acknowledged that somehow they're supposed to, when they grow up, they're not supposed to feel it anymore. Um, the other thing is um, emotional pain, because we know now, you know, or we knew, we've always known, maybe you've always known that boys do crave, you know, emotional connections and protecting you know, those relationships and connections to other people, that they are therefore emotionally vulnerable to being rejected and being ridiculed and that that's a real thing and that we need to attend to that, their vulnerability. And again, that it's part of the human condition and necessary for both learning and love. 
Because if you, you know, when you're learning, you're inherently vulnerable because you have to admit that you don't know something in order to learn it. And it's frustrating than that whole risk of looking like a failure or looking like a fool in front of other people. So if you're going to have boys learn, they have to know how to acknowledge and be okay with their vulnerability to understand that everyone is vulnerable and love, of course. If you can't be vulnerable with someone, you can't show them who you are. And then it makes it very, very difficult. Um, and building courage and resistance. And I'm seeing the clock, I have 30 minutes. And I can send you my notes too later. But um, uh, let's see, uh, affirming their relational capabilities. Um, Jackson Katz named it in a very nice way. This is not sensitivity training for boys, which is kind of this way of people dismissing it. It's, it's leadership training. It's showing boys how to be you know, in relationships with other people, which again, as I indicated, is important for their professional career as well as their personal relationships. And then um, you've probably heard fostering connections to self and others a million times, if not only from me. So um, keep in mind, and I say to this to my students, boys are watching you. What are they learning you know, about themselves, about other people, about the world? We want to promote and emphasize relational definitions of success so that they don't have to choose. As one adolescent boy said, maybe then I could be successful and also happy. I'm going to stop it right there. I'm happy to share my notes and slides. I'm sorry. I that. It's always like I have, you know, I teach a course that's 10 weeks. And I'm like, I'm going to squish 10 weeks of material into one hour and give it to them all at once. And it probably feels that way. So, but I will give you my um, email address. I am happy to share my notes. I'm happy to have you, you know, email me with anything that caught your attention, but you felt like I flew past or something. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm going to hand it back to Gene so he can close this out and keep everybody oh. on the clock. Dr. Chi, this was wonderful, uh, and it is a lot, and it's because it's so important, right? Uh, and so thank you, first and foremost. Um, there was one question in the chat I, I wanted to get to um, really quickly. Um, uh, Michael had asked, why can't the conversation be simply about what it means to be a good person regardless of gender, right? And, and he cites Mr. the gospel of Mr. Rogers, right? Rules one, two, and three, be kind. So can you, to close this out, you know, why is this so important to also name it in the gender terms as well as, I mean, we certainly talk about this is what it means to be a good human here, but we're also a boys school, so we have to address the gender side, but, but how do you see this? Actually, I agree with him. I agree that it would be much better to emphasize be a good person, you know, and so I, I think the reason for it and that doesn't justify why it's done. The reason for it is because a lot of people are still very much kind of conceptualizing and approaching the world and interactions in gendered terms. And so that creates the need to kind of address that. But I, I agree that, I mean, I, I think that um, we are moving towards a more, you know, gender as a spectrum and not really, you know, and moving away from the gender binary and moving away from even binary descriptions of, you know, physiology and things like that, because it really is, it truly is a spectrum. And so the, the binary constructions don't fit anymore, but I feel like we're still in this kind of transitional phase where it ends up, come, the question comes up and therefore there's usually a need to address it. But I absolutely agree that moving towards, you know, looking at people as people, and you, you, there's just no, the categories don't fit, <laughs> you know, don't, are, aren't working anyway. And, and they, they really, if anything, seem to trap people. So if we can move away from those, all the better. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will be sharing the chat. I'll share the chat with you, Dr. Chu. Uh, oh, and you. as we did earlier, if you want to share your notes with me, I'll make sure they get <laughs> into an upcoming newsletter uh, so that everyone here can, can see it as uh, you, you all may have noticed we're recording this. So uh, in, an upcoming, in an upcoming Browning newsletter, we'll have a, a link to this video. And uh, given jo Dr. Chu's kindness here, um, we'll also have a PDF of those notes uh, so people can, can refer. And I know it's a lot to take in. Uh, it's important work. We're, we're thrilled to be doing it. We're really thrilled to be in partnership with people like Dr. Chu and being able to learn from her expertise. So you'll see all the thanks that are in the chat uh, as I send that to you later. But I will echo them here. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, it's always eerie to hear my son described by someone who's never met him, right? And that is an ongoing experience as we have these, these examples. So I, I am grateful in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you and good luck and best wishes. Take care. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.